Welcome to Moments in Time on the Inside Line with Lucy and Byfield. Today, we should look back briefly on some historical US Grand Prix. There have been many Formula One races in the United States of America, but not all have been called the US Grand Prix, with titles such as East, West and others added to the name, but not counting as official US Grand Prix. Think of Dallas, Detroit and even Las Vegas. In the past, names like Sebring, Watkins Glen, Riverside, Phoenix and Indianapolis have hosted the race, but in recent years, since 2012, the US Grand Prix has been at COTA, the Circuit of the Americas. After many years absence from the calendar, and also some years at the aforementioned tracks, yielding little success at finding a home in the US, COTA seems to have it all. A great looking and loved by the drivers kind of circuit, modern with all of the up-to-date facilities and a highlight on the calendar. But still, the US of A love them Indy cars and them NASCARs more. Lewis Hamilton and Michael Schumacher have been the big winners in the US, but let's look back at just a few classic races. 2015. After Lewis Hamilton shoved and bumped Nico Rosberg out of Turn 1, calling it understeer, a condition he used to have regularly, it was Rosberg who late in the rain affected race happened to be on the right tyres and blasted back past Lewis to what looked like an easy win, keeping him in title contention. But according to Nico, a gust of wind caught him out. He went off and regained the track only to see Lewis sail on by to claim his third title at the time. The race was famous for the weather, with session cancellations and a messed up weekend format, but more for Hatgate, the incident where Lewis tossed Nico's second place hat to him and Nico threw it back. 1990, Gerhard Berger joined McLaren and out-qualified Senna in Phoenix in the first race together as teammates. Senna, usually a master at street circuits and in the USA, got his revenge by winning the race as Berger crashed out when his foot slipped off the pedals and he careered into a barrier. But it was Jean Alacy who set the world on fire that day. Having made such an impression in his half season in 1989, he was retained by Tyrrell in that iconic blue and white beauty of a car and somehow raced wheel to wheel with Senna for the lead, taking it and fighting Senna repeatedly. He came second, but notice had been served and John's services were highly sought after during that season, with Tyrrell, Williams and Ferrari all fighting for his signature. At the time, all the talk was of him being a future world champion, one of the most exciting drivers to come to Formula 1 in a very long time. With history to reflect upon, it was Jean Alacy who basically got rich by following his heart, not his head, signed for Ferrari as they embarked on a truly horrific period in their competitiveness and ended his career with one lucky win. 1973. Jackie Stewart had already sealed his third world title and was about to enter his 100th and final Grand Prix, but his junior teammate, the handsome and talented Francois Severe, was to be decapitated in qualifying, so Stewart didn't race in the respect of his fallen teammate. Severe had got to the point in his career where he was ready to lead the Tyrrell team and at the time, they were right at the pointy end of the grid and had been for a number of seasons. The race was won by Ronnie Peterson, but the mood and vibe was one of grief and sadness in an era where driver deaths were common. As for Stewart and Tyrrell pulling out of the event, they handed the constructors title to Lotus. At least Severe did taste the victory champagne, even if only once, winning the race in 1971. 2005 gave us the biggest farce in Formula 1 history when only six cars fitted with Bridgestone tyres took the start of the race. Michelin had suffered incidents and felt it was unsafe to race. Pleading with organisers for a temporary chicane to reduce loads on tyres was met with what was to be expected when there are too many chiefs and not enough Indians involved in running the sport. At the time, Fernando Alonso was in the ascendancy and strangely after five years of domination, with Nando absent, Michael Schumacher took his only win of the season. I must mention 2007. Fernando Alonso, new at McLaren, a double world champ too, was being shown the way by rookie Lewis Hamilton by the one-third mark of the season. 
and had him completely mentally rattled. Lewis had won for the first time at the previous Canadian Grand Prix and would do so in the US too. Politics were rife at the time and on the podium, I don't think we have ever seen Nando look so white and also so fake. He was massively upset, furious at Ron Dennis for allowing inter-team rivalry and as it turned out, both would lose the title by one point and Nando would leave the team at the end of the year. In closing, let us remember the final win for Kimi Raikkonen in 2018. He had been back at Ferrari in his second stint with the team for five years, scoring many podiums, a couple of pole positions, but wins eluded him since he had last won in 2013 for Lotus, um, Renault, um, Benetton. Mm, think the current Renault team. Anyway, Kimi was thrashed at Ferrari in 2014 in a dog of a car by Fernando Alonso who could drive a bad car and make it look good. But over the years, we only saw Kimi shine when he felt like the car really suited him. And there were some questionable team tactics <coughs> orders that hampered him as Vettel's teammate. It looked like Kimi would never win again, but finally he won at Kota in 2018. And it was not a lucky or inherited win. He won it on pace and strategy. There was not a single criticism to be heard and the paddock loved seeing the elder statesman win after so long. For me, it was the highlight of the year, even over Ricciardo's wins. Well, that's it for Moments in Time on the Inside Line with Lucien Byfield. Catch you later.